Welcome to Smart Citizen. I'm Emily Bose. Really excited to jump into this interview with school board candidate Jen Franklin. Thank you so much for absolutely being here and, and speaking no with us today. Thank you. And you're running for the Kempsville district, is that correct? Correct. But okay. keep in mind that in Virginia Beach, you can vote for anybody in any district in it local elections. Such an interesting thing. And yeah. since you mentioned it, we can jump into some questions, but I'd love for people to know a little bit about you first. So can you tell us high level, your background, why you're running for school board, and just what do you think are the most important things for people to know about you going into this election? So basically, um, I have kind of a unique perspective. I was adopted. So I was three and a half when my Mennonite um, German parents <laughs> adopted me. Um, and so I'm really, really grateful for all the opportunities I've had. Um, you know, I basically, I grew up in uh, on a farm in Pennsylvania. And uh, so I like to joke that I know more about sauce than kimchi. That's my running joke right now. Um, and uh, <laughs> so, but I just have a, a kind of a unique perspective. I was one of three minorities in my whole town. Um, so, you know, basically I, I, I know what it is to feel different. And I, I know there's a lot of talk about equity council right now and school board and stuff like that. So I have a unique perspective there, I do believe. But just in terms of why I'm running, you know, I came here with the United States military with the Navy. I was active duty when I got stationed here um, at NES Oceana. And I just stayed here. I've been here since 1989. And um, I had a, a, a run as a single parent for about eight years. Mm -hmm. And I got very involved in my daughter's school, you know, and back then I didn't really have much money. So what I did was I donated my time. And so I was room mom, you know, all during elementary school. And then, you know, I started with PTSA, um, you know, when she was in middle school, served on various committees. And then, you know, by the time she was in high school, I was, you know, serving as treasurer and all kinds of different positions. Um, and then also with my stepsons, you know, I was involved with their schools as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I really found a passion for helping the teachers and students. And and quite frankly, not just them, the, the janitors. I love talking to the janitors and custodians and, you know, just getting to know people in the school. And I, I think for parents, that is um, a missed opportunity when you don't get involved in your children's you know, education and get to know the people that they're with all day long, because um, they're great people. I, I would say that everybody that I came in contact with was incredibly supportive and really did want the best for the kids. Um, so I really got involved with education back then. I felt like I had a passion for it. I, I actually checked how many hours I probably had spent in the Virginia Beach City Schools between my daughter and my stepsons, um, and probably close to like 10 to 12,000 hours, uh, boots on wow. the ground in the schools between all the different things that I, I did for the school. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I've spent a lot of time and I still feel like I have a passion. Um, when I learned of some of the thing, the issues that they were um, coming up with right now, just, you know, um, conversations, you know, issues they're dealing with on school board. I was really frustrated that we have so much um, contention for one on the school board. And also, you know, I feel like they're is the way that the school board typically votes right now. I feel like there is a, a huge chunk of the Virginia Beach community that is not being um, represented, so to speak, in some of the decisions that they're making. And I just feel like it's important to make sure that we are having conversations um, that, are, that are in the best interest of the whole community and not just for a certain sector. I have noticed, and I've I've spoken to several people who are running for school board mm -hmm. and a couple of incumbents on the school board now, and haven't gotten into this topic yet. Sure. And I saw some of it coming up on your social media as well. It does seem like there's quite a bit of um, tension, if you will, mm -hmm. yeah, in right. the school board members. And I noticed you're running with a group of four people specifically. Mm -hmm. So depending on how this election goes, as you said, people in Virginia Beach is kind of a unique uh, election setup where we have these separate districts, but people can vote for anyone mm -hmm. in any district, no matter where they live, both for city council and for school board. And Correct. I know, That's right. I know there's a case uh, in court right now to potentially try to litigate that or, or address it. Um, but that's the situation right now. So, mm -hmm. um, with that said, depending on the outcome of the election, how would you seek to work well with the other people that are on the school board? Cause it seems like having that sense of collaboration and keeping in mind, you are representing the entire mm -hmm. city is pretty essential. 
Well, first, I, I have two questions that I'm going to constantly ask myself. First of all, does it support the teachers and students? That is number one. If anything comes up that does not feel like it's supporting the teachers and students, automatically I'm going to have some questions. Why are we doing this then? Why why is this? Why are we going to spend money on this? Um, you know, how can we get back to supporting the teachers and students? Um, and second, my question is, um, are we um, being a good um, guardian of our taxpayer dollars? You know, are we wisely spending taxpayers' money? You know, and it because really the school board should be there solely for educational purposes. Um, and, you know, some of the th things that they're really trying to um, bring into the school board world, so to speak, I, I really feel like are not necessarily things that we should be focusing on right now. Um, and we should be focusing on things like making sure that we've got smaller classrooms, we've got teachers that love being there and are paid well to do that, um, that we have really um, you know, opportunities to go out there. And I know that this is going to be one of your questions, but, you know, for, for more workforce enforcement uh, or, or readiness mm -hmm. programs, mm -hmm. um, you know, part of what people need to know is that, you know, I did try college right after high school. I was in the, you know, I was honor roll high school. Um, I did go to college. Um, unfortunately, when I came back from college, you know, I, I decided that I was going to um, follow my boyfriend into the military because we were going to travel the world together. And obviously that didn't work. But um, but it was still the military was a great uh, adventure. And it was probably the one of the best things I ever did. It really helped me grow up and and develop a real passion for serving my country. And um, and I, I've got to say that, you know, I truly believe that some of those experiences that bind us, um, bind the team, um, you know, Luis, uh, Joanna, Vicky, and I, you know, we all have, Joanna, uh, Luis, and I have all served in the military. And I will tell you that in the military, you're with people from all over the country. And sometimes you don't necessarily get along with them. But mm -hmm. the fact is you've got a mission to do. You've got a mission that you've got to make sure it works um, successfully. And I think that is one thing that we all can attest to is that even if you don't necessarily agree with somebody because of our military background, we still know how to get a job done and work together to make that happen. And that is what we're running on at this point is because there are, there are, there are personalities on the school board that are clashing heavily and um, it's unfortunate because I feel like it's getting in the way of really serving the teacher students and really getting down to the true nature of what everybody should be sitting on that board uh, for, which is to primarily make sure teachers and students um, are in it to get a, the best education we can um, and, you know, have great jobs for teachers and great opportunities. So. Can I ask you a quick favor? I think sure. Is your phone ringer on or something? Do you mind switching it off? There's like a ding in the background. Or you might just I be am. able to close your email. Um, we can move on. I just wanted to check because I was noticing that pop up, and I just didn't want to take away from anything you were saying with a no. Thank a you. Yeah. Notification. No. So you talked about several things there that are really interesting. And first, I wanted to say thank you so much for your service. I didn't actually have a chance to tell Luis that I spoke with him this morning, and I know he's running in that group with you. And yes. Mm -hmm. That is something that I deeply appreciate and, and want to make sure to mention. So oh, well, thank, thank you. you guys yeah. for that. And I think it's an interesting thing that I've observed with uh, living here. I don't have a military background, but I work with lots of people that do. And yeah. um, obviously living in Virginia Beach, you, it's it, you'd be hard pressed to live here and not know anyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> With a military exactly. background, which is <laughs> it's great. It's actually been a great part of my experience here. So yeah. I've noticed that um, ability to think about having a bigger goal than just mm -hmm. your own personal focus, like you mentioned. So I I think that makes a lot of sense and is a theme that I've noticed. What are some of the things that you feel like the school board is focusing on now that you don't think they should be? And how would you redirect that focus if you were to be elected? You mentioned when you were chatting that you feel like there's a lot of focus on the wrong things. What what are some of examples of those? Things? Well, OK, so, for example, um, there was a recent meeting and, and, and I've got to be honest, you know, and I really didn't watch the school board meetings until I started wanting to run and and. Um, and shame on me, you know, I, I probably should have been doing that sooner. But um, so just watching the meetings recently, um, there was probably a full hour 
when we had a very important topic that was devoted to a school board member not wearing her mask. And almost a full hour was taken, you know, during the meeting to talk about, you know, this person not wearing her mask, um, when she did have a reason to not wear a mask, she was socially distanced, you know, and it became such a huge um, time waster in my personal opinion. Um, and, you know, yes, we absolutely want to be safe. We want everyone to feel safe, but she was socially distanced more than 20 feet apart from the next person. Um, and I, it, for us, as a community do accept the fact that we spent over an hour of the school board meeting discussing this person not wearing her mask, I, I think is a huge time waster for everybody. Um, but, you know, so there, there are people on the board that want to instead focus their time on these type of issues, trying to denigrate somebody, trying to, you know, bring bring light to someone's disability. Um, and, and, you know, and I think that if anybody was treated like that, um, it, it, let's just let's just turn it around. If they were treated, if the people that were doing that were treating were treated like that themselves, they probably would have had a huge issue. Mm -hmm. So I've really, you know, quite honestly, I, I'm not in it. I, I, I'm not a judgmental person. I was just talking to someone the other day, and I said, you know, I grew up in a very very strict um, church, strict strict house. Um, I'm not a judgmental person. I know what it feels like to be judged. I don't want to judge. I don't want other people to judge me. I can't help it if they do, but you know, um, I'm not going to react to it because what I've learned being different than, than a lot of people growing up is that once you allow them to, to let it bother you, you've just let them win, right? So if you allow somebody, and that's the only way that they can really impact you, right, is if you allow that to sink in mm -hmm. and let it upset you, then then they've won. And I really feel like there is so much immature behavior happening on school board right now. And, and, I, and I will say, I don't want to be a part of that. And I want to change that, in fact. Um, I don't want to spend time. I, somebody should have said, Hello, we we need we have important issues to discuss here, you know, and for there were not enough people. And that's really what my goal is, is to actually bringing some common sense and some dec decency and some leveling out. Because right now, the way there are either people on the school board that will not stand up for everybody or there is bullying happening on the school board. There is just absolute bullying happening because, you know, there are three people that are sitting in the minority right now and they don't get a fair shake, in, in my personal opinion. And I would say that on the other side, if, if, if same, same thing, if, if someone on the, you know, the, the, the folks that typically are in the eight, the, the voting, voting for the eight, you know, I would say if they were being treated unfairly, I would step in for them. I don't have any kind of bias towards anybody, but I just feel like we have to get back to the true nature of why we're all sitting there. And that is to focus our time, energy and resources on the students and teachers. And if we're doing anything outside of that, it, it is a waste of time and, and resources and money. Something that you have mentioned, uh, in, in some of the articles and things I've read where you've been mm -hmm. interviewed, you talked about an experience that you had in boot camp that I thought was really interesting mm -hmm. where yeah. they made you work together with someone yes. to kind of work yeah. through something like that. So can you tell us a little bit more about that and maybe how you would apply some of those principles you learned to this situation? Oh, well, actually, the, the reason I remember that, that, I mean, that was over 20, you know, gosh, I'm trying to think, like uh, 26 years ago now. But it, it still stands out in my mind because, you know, I was 19 at the time. Um, and of course, as a 19 year old, you think you know everything, right? So I go to boot camp, and they, boy, do they rock your world. Um, you know, the minute you, <laughs> you go in there, you know, you're, you haven't had any sleep. It's three o'clock in the morning. Your company commander is in there, throws a trash can lid, you know, down the, the middle of the, the, um, the room, and it's like, wake up, you know. Da -da. It, it, so boot camp, everybody pro should probably go through boot camp. <laughs> it's a very humbling, but also mm -hmm. um, they, they, they tear you down to build you back up. And, and one of the things that they did, so again, you have, have people from all over the country. And I had, um, and I, I'm going to say this because I'm from the North. So I had a gal that was, you know, from, uh, I think, Louisiana, Arkansas, something like that. And in, in all fairness, I might have been the only Asian that she ever had met, <laughs> you know. And of course, I don't speak Asian, you know, I don't sound Asian. So um, she's, you know, anyway, but uh, I firmly do believe that it was because I, would, I looked different. She probably had never even, you know, spoken to an Asian before. Um, and, and she immediately, 
did not like me for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And and that's the only reason that I say it's it probably is that because I, I literally had not even had any conversations with her. She just didn't like me. So with that being said, it is what it is. Um, but uh, there was a clear animosity that she had shown me. And of course, when someone treats you like that, you're not exactly loving them either. So especially when you're 19. <laughs> yeah, especially when you're 19. Um, so the company commander, in her wisdom, basically made us bunk mates. So when you're bunk mates, <laughs> you have to do a lot of things together. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I didn't like it. She didn't like it. But the fact is, over the course of four weeks, we learned to work together because we had to because you know, if we didn't, we're going to be doing push ups, or we're going to, you know, we're going to, you know, miss out on other opportunities or advantages that other people have. So and we were both luckily very competitive. So we learned to work together. And I have to say, did I like her at the end of boot camp? Not so much. But the fact is, that was a great learning experience. It was a great learning experience, because it showed me you don't have to like everybody. You don't have to. There are going to be people that just don't like you for whatever reason, because you're wearing coral that day and they hate the color coral, you know, whatever it is. Um, and and you can't force people to do anything. You can't force people to like you. But what you can do, especially if you have a leadership position, if you're serving on boards, if you're in a position where you have a mission to accomplish, what you can do is learn to find your common thread and learn to work together for the mission. And our mission on school board is to do the right, make the right choices for our education system, for our community, for the parents, the teachers, students, and administration. And as long as we're doing that, then we're getting the mission done. So that's, you know, it was a great learning experience. Absolutely, at the, especially at that age. Mm-hmm. It sounds like it. I could see that being both very challenging and yes. enlightening at the yeah, same time. Yeah, for sure. So yeah. you're you're obviously very passionate and uh, something you've talked quite a bit about um, being passionately involved in on here and other interviews I've seen with you is your involvement with the uh, PTSA through mm -hmm. yeah. the last quite quite a few years. And one question for you that I would love your insight on mm -hmm. with sure. kind of an inside scoop what would you see as the role of PTSA compared to the school board uh, within the overall education system? Like what, what role does the PTSA play? Why is it important for people to be involved in that versus, you know, what role does the school board play and what importance would it be for people to be involved in that? And like, what ways do you see, or would you recommend people getting involved in either one, either one or both of those? Well, I've got to tell you, so um, as, as I said, if you're not heavily involved in PTSA, then you have a missed opportunity there because you should be getting to know the people that are spending all this time with your children. Um, you know, I can't tell you all the times that, you know, just just getting face to face time, you know, you're mm -hmm. in the school doing, you know, volunteer opportunities. You're you're going to be speaking to teachers. You're going to be speaking to the principal. You're going to get to know those people. And, um, you know, when, when I was PTSA president of Kempsville High School, um, I would have a lot of parents after meetings because I, I I always try to find humor and you know make a make the meeting humorous because I find human you know humor typically binds people right and um and I, I'm very you know self deprecating I you know I, I have a lot of things that I can joke about myself and and I, that's okay right um and and so you know when I when I would have somebody come up a parent say gosh, you know, I really feel like we should do this or let's do, you know, let's put this in place. I'd say, oh my gosh, I love your passion. So what committee can you serve on? Because we need people like you to serve, right? And then obviously they would say, well, you know, I work, I do this, you know, a million excuses why they can't get involved. And I'd say, well, you know, unfortunately that's the problem. We have so many um, hats we're already wearing on PTSA and we need people, we need hands to jump in and, and help because, you know, we all work for full-time jobs, most of us. Well, you know, at Kempsville High School, I can tell you every single parent had a full-time job. And so, um, you know, we all work full-time jobs and we're doing this because we're passionate about the kids and, you know, wanting to support the teachers. Um, so I, I would ask everybody, it doesn't, you know, and, and, and I talked to my um, assistant about this previously and I said, you know, 
she's a, she was a single mom. And I said to her, I was a single mom when I started. And, you know, you might not be able to donate as much time. You know, you might not be able to. But, you know, if somebody asks, if you get something, an email asking to send in a bag of candy because we're putting Halloween bags together, you know, or, or you know, Halloween bags together, or treat bags together for the teachers, just send in a bag. Send in, send in a bag of candy. Because, you know, I've spent, I can honestly say I've spent thousands of dollars you know, on my time as PTSA because we didn't have enough people donate. So I would spend, you know, $300 on bags of candy because, you know, we didn't have enough candy to go around and I needed to make sure the teachers were supported. So, um, you know, it's so important just to donate what you can to help out because every little bit helps. So in, in terms of PTSA, I'm incredibly passionate. I feel like, um, you know, doing your part as small as it might be is so incredibly important because the teachers do so much for the kids and we always want to make them feel like they're supported, right? Um, from the school board perspective, we, gosh, that's such an important job. Um, you know, you're putting policies in place that, that teachers um, are having to, you know, um, roll with. Uh, probably one of the biggest things that I hear from teachers' comments is that we're constantly changing. Can we just find a curriculum that we can stick to, get to know? Because they're constantly feeling like they're spread so thin you know, and they've got so many hats to wear and they've got so much to do during the day. I mean, they're working sometimes 12 to 14 hours a day and they're not getting paid enough to do that, right? Mm -hmm. So what I would say is let's allow the teachers to, you know, find more efficient ways to spend their time. Do their, to actually get back to just teaching and doing their job instead of having to learn all these new, um, you know, programs and this and that and, and throwing stuff at them that they have to constantly be updating. And, 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 and you know, I, it, nobody likes that. If you had a job that you had changes every, you know, every year, or if you had something that you had to constantly be redirecting your resources or time, and, you know, you're already working your butt off to try and, you know, keep up as it is, it would be frazzling. It would, it would be frustrating. And then al also you have to listen to um, teacher complaints and you're not, and you might not always feel supported by your principal or by the administration or the school board. Um, you know, that is probably part of the problem that we have in the school systems and not, and not just Virginia Beach. You wanna talk about teacher support, let's support them wholly, not just with just pay issues, which we should be talking about, but let's, let's support them wholly and get them the resources that they need. I mean, if, if we have to have a situation where things are changing, it should be the people that are making the changes that should do a lot of the heavy lifting, right? Because they're already doing a lot of the work and they shouldn't have to try to figure out this new program. We should have the resources in place to allow them to, to figure that out without a whole lot of time spent on it. Um, and I think it's just getting back to common sense, um, uh, policy, common sense changes, um, you know, and I, I think that that should be the focus and the goal of the incoming school board because we need to ensure, I'm sorry, I'm going to change this. So the, uh, the sun that just came out doesn't, no <laughs> but um, we should, we should change this so that we are really doing that, making the changes that the teachers need to feel supported, um, to feel like they don't have to constantly, um, use their time, which is a resource, to continually um, get updated with new changes and, and, and just, you know, things like that that we can do to make their lives simpler, more efficient, feel more uh, appreciated and supported. Uh, that, that's what I'd like to see for teachers. Looking Sorry. at the student side of things, you have mentioned, and we were chatting a little bit before we went live about another area that you're passionate about, which is continuing to award the valedictorian salutatorian mm -hmm. awards after this year. I know the school board voted recently to do away with those and move toward a Latin honor system. Mm -hmm. uh, would you keep both options or what's, what would be your goal uh, if you were elected as far as those awards were concerned? Well, I've got to tell you, so um, 
I've, I've gotten a lot of feedback about the valve cell issue because that is something that our whole team feels very passionate about. And what I would say is that um, I'm in sales. Uh, well, well, first of all, let me just say this. As a single mom, um, you know, I worked four jobs. I, I literally had no job when um, my husband and I separated. And so I immediately had to put things in place to figure out what I was going to do to support my, my daughter. And so I, you know, luckily I had a friend who owned a bakery. She let me wash dishes you know, in the morning, you know, as soon as I dropped my daughter off from school, I went and I've washed dishes before she opened for $20 a day, you know, that, that got me groceries for the week, mm -hmm. you know, and then I, I was a reservist back then. So I did my reserve weekends. I, you know, I did taxes with H and R block. I, you know, worked, I was trying to, you know, um, get my mortgage career off the crown. And so I can tell you that everything that I've done has been performance-based. Every, everything I've done to change my economic status has been about me performing. And so, and I feel like if we have a Super Bowl, if we have NCAA championships, if we have performance-based um, entertainment, then we have to prepare these kids to leave, you know, leave school, which is our job as parents and teachers, right, is to make sure that our kids can be successful once they leave, right? And I feel like if we're not teaching them that performance matters, that being on time matters, that putting in your homework matters, then we are doing them such a disservice because when they go out into the workforce and they're like, hey, by the way, I'm going to show up late today. Is that OK? Is that cool? Or, hey, by the way, you know, I don't really feel like working today because I'm, I'm a little bit tired or I, you know, I don't feel so good. Well, I'm sorry, an employer is going to say, you know, gosh, you know, I've got someone else who really wants this job um, and we're mm -hmm. going to hire them instead. You know, your performance is a little bit lacking. If we don't teach them the skills now, who's going to teach them? They're going to have to learn it, learn it through the school of hard knocks, because I'm going to be honest with you, as somebody who, hi, you know, who wants to hire folks, um, I'm not going to hire somebody who wants to sit on their tushy and not worry about how they're performing that day. You know, we're everything is is um, not everything, but most most things in life are performance based, right? And so what I would say is we are doing them a disservice. We've got to bring back Valsal. Those kids work so extremely hard. And I'm going to say I was never Valsal. My kids were never in the running for Valsal. I, you know, I had no skin in this game, but I'm going to tell you they deserve it. I've talked to many uh, valedictorians, salutatorians, and the things that they do to earn that title are just amazing. They're always going above and beyond. They're always doing that, going, taking it to the next level, pushing themselves. And those are the kids that we need. What, what is going to be the benefit other than just a high GPA? You know, we've got to award those kids. I don't think that we, I also agree because I've gotten a lot of feedback about, you know, other kids feeling like they don't necessarily matter then because they're not Valsal. And I agree mm -hmm. that we should be showing kids appreciation for working hard. I would have to take a look at that, take recommendations. I'm open to seeing what we can do, but I don't think that eliminating a val -sal position is fair either. These kids work really, really hard to be number one and number two, um, and they should be, be able to have that title. Um, but I'm not saying that we eliminate the ability to provide other honors as well. It's just, I don't want to get rid of that. I feel like we could take this in one of two directions that I think both of which you would like to talk about. One would be, you know, the student teacher discipline side of things, which I'd like to get into. And then let's go from there and then talk about uh, some workforce things as well. Okay. We kind of yeah. touched on both there and I think both things would be great to get into. So whichever one you want to start with, dive into. I know we're getting some questions in the comments about you know, you asking if you support empowering teachers to discipline students. So maybe we should start there. And I know you've talked about uh, school discipline a little bit. So let's jump in there and then we can go into the workforce things. Well, obviously, I don't think that we should ha have teachers, you know, wrapping the kids' knuckles like they did, you know, in Catholic <laughs> school or something. But, um, you know, I, I, I think that teachers have to be supported. Um, probably some of the biggest concerns that teachers have, and I, and I have many clients that are teachers. I have friends that are teachers. Um, you know, my kids' friends are teachers. Um, and some of the big things that they're talking about is that they have no control in the classroom right now. And that's not fair to them. It's not fair to the other kids. It's actually not fair to the child that is creating the the um, the confusion in the, cl the classroom or creating the discipline issues in the classroom. It's not fair to them either. Um, I, you know, I was talking to someone today about um, training their their new puppy, 
And, you know, and they said it's got to be consistent. They've got to have structure and you can't keep changing your mind about what the rules are. You've got to have consistency. And I think that is true with 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 training puppies, with with raising kids. They've got to have structure and they've got to know what the boundaries are. Right. I mm -hmm. think if they don't, then they're confused. It creates confusion, not only for them, but also for all the other kids. They don't know what the boundaries are. And so all of a sudden, there's no respect in the classroom. And I think that the world, if everybody treated each other with respect, you know, then we would all be in a much better place. So respect has to start coming back into the classrooms, right? And so teachers have got to show their kids respect. But Students have absolutely got to respect their teachers. They have to do it. And unfortunately, we have a, situa a situation right now where many teachers, many, in fact, I, I haven't talked to one teacher who hasn't said that discipline is not an issue. And I think we're putting our heads in the sand if we try to pretend that that doesn't happen in Virginia Beach schools, it does. Every single teacher I've talked to said discipline's an issue. And so, you know, I've heard of kids, you know, having to sit there and then other kids have just got to listen to them, you know, calling the teacher names, doing whatever they, and, and, you know, like everybody's worried about detention and suspension, you know, oh, well, we don't want to suspend kids these days. It's going to make them feel bad. Well, gosh, maybe instead of looking at it that way, maybe we should say, let's pull the kid out. Let's find out what the real issue is. Cause I don't believe that kids um, are come out of the womb and are uh, and want to create discipline issues. There's something that is going on with that child. Let's figure that out and try to get that child some help, right? Because quite honestly, just letting them go off in the classroom and and create and become a nuisance of themselves, that's not helping. That's not helping anybody. It doesn't help the teacher to teach. It doesn't help the kids that want to learn learn, and it certainly doesn't help them because now all they're doing is creating a, a disruption but their problem is not being solved, right? They might be getting attention, but it's negative attention. Absolutely. Can I ask you a question about that sure. then? Because we talked before about how obviously teachers are pretty overstretched. And yes. if you're having that be part of the responsibility for teachers, I can imagine, especially if every single teacher is having discipline challenges. I don't know if that's all the same kids or, you know what I mean? How that's A lot of times out. it is. Yeah. So it, would that pulling the student aside, getting into that with them, would you see that being done by the teachers, by guidance counselors? Like who are the people that you would see stepping into that role and how would you, you know, empower or encourage them to, to take those steps if you were on the Well, they should be excused from the classroom, first of all. We, we should, they should be taken out of the classroom so that they can still teach. And, you know, back in the day, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know how different it is, but my gosh, being sent to the principal's office was like, oh my God, please don't send me to the principal's office, right? So I, I don't know if the principal needs to step in, if, you know, uh, what needs to happen there, but they have to be removed from the classroom because what they're looking for is negative attention, right? right. They're looking for attention in any way they can. So they figure negative attention is, is better than anything. Mm -hmm. um, it makes them feel empowered. It probably, you know, whatever the psychological reason is for that. But, you know, maybe a guidance counselor comes, you know, with a, with a school resource officer, if, if it's a situation where somebody could, you know, potentially need to have, um, it can't handle the student. But a guidance counselor and a school resource officer, whoever, or principal or whoever it needs to be, they come to the classroom and take, or better yet, you know, if, if the child would actually because um, I don't necessarily want to embarrass the child either, but you know somehow we need to remove the child from the classroom. Right. And then the guidance counselor can sit there and talk to them. And you know I would think that initially having to go and sit with somebody and talk to them about their feelings is probably almost punishment enough, right? <laughs> when you're For a child, a <laughs> <laughs> For a child, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're if, if you're in that position, you're like, oh my gosh, please don't. I don't want to talk about that. You know, for whatever reason, maybe they mm -hmm. they're embarrassed. Maybe they're they don't feel empowered to talk about their issues or problems that are going on, but it's so important. You know, we just did a walk. Um, the team just did a walk for the National Alliance for Mental Illness on mm -hmm. Saturday. And I've got to say, you know, I had a coworker that committed suicide and 
that was really, oh my gosh, that was, that was probably one of the worst experiences I've ever had. Um, even more so than just someone losing a life in a car, car accident, someone committing suicide and, and thinking, gosh, I should have done more. I should have done, you know, what, what could I have done differently? You know, did right. I say something wrong? You know, all of that is just awful. And <clears throat> I personally feel like, you know, these kids that are acting out, we need to help them. We don't need to ignore them, ignore their behavior. I think that by telling them we, we're not going to accept this behavior, we're actually showing them we care, that we want to help you. What can we do to help you? You know, you can't act like this. This is not acceptable behavior, but what can we do to help you? And I would love to see more um, maybe big brothers, big sisters, or more mm -hmm. ways that we can get in here and actually help those kids. And this is what I'm talking about. We're, you know, I'm not, uh, and I've told people this, I, as a single mom, I didn't have time to just chatter. You know, people say, oh, you know, you talk about this. If I'm going to talk about it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to find a way to get it done because I don't have enough time. Even now in my life, I don't have enough time to just talk. You know, if you're not going to be solution-based, then I, it's no use that we have a conversation because I don't have time to just talk. So if we want to really help these kids, we need to find ways to really bring solution-based um, opportunities here. And people, the, these kids that are acting out, they need help in some sort, whether it's just someone mm -hmm. to lean on, whether it's someone to listen to them, whether it's someone to actually help them if they're in a, in a situation where they don't feel safe. We need to figure out what is going on and not just say they're a bad kid, you know? Right. Because I don't, I don't think that kids just come out like that. I think that they're taught to behave like that, um, and maybe not taught the language to express what's going on. Correct. Inside of them oh or, my gosh, or that, ask for help, right? That is. My, that, oh, you just hit the nail on the head. They don't know yeah. how to express it. Yeah. Yeah. So my my nephew has um uh, was adopted out of foster care actually, and had a lot of trauma. And yes, I've been yeah. really amazed. He's seven and has had a lot of therapy and has a lot of language for how to express his emotions. And I've listened to conversations with him and my sister-in-law where, you know, she's like, what big emotion yeah. are you feeling right now? Yes, and you yeah, can yeah. tell her, I'm exactly. feeling disappointed. And I think, wow, most adults that I know don't have the capacity to right. self-reflect what big emotion am I feeling right now that's driving my poor behavior? You know why? And because so, we were we were never taught that. We were never right. taught how to do that. And you know, and, and honestly, you know, um, I'm eventually I'd love to write a book about adversity and you know, and and how the friction causes you to be stronger. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I really, I really feel like, you know, these kids they they are going through some hellacious situations. But if we can teach them. That friction doesn't have to be the downfall of you. That friction mm -hmm. can be what makes you stronger and builds mm -hmm. you up and gives you the, the hind quarters to be able to get through the tough things in life because we're all going to hit tough, tough ends in life, right? But some people, if they're not taught how to push through and if they're taught to quit or they're taught to give up or feel like they're not good enough or taught they're not good enough to actually make it to the next level, then they're, you know, it's so unfortunate because what I have learned through all my adversity in life is that if you push through through, if you find the gumption to get to the, the end of that, to get to the end of the tunnel, you've learned so much about life and you've learned so much about your own personal character and how to get through the tough times. And eventually, if you push through, there is that light. There, there is a good future for you. There is all the things that you've ever wanted could be right mm -hmm. there if you just go, you know, five feet in front of you more. And and if COVID has taught us anything, it's the importance of resilience, right? Yes, it's the fact that exactly. It's exactly. Such an essential thing. And you see it across businesses and people and organizations that yeah. the resilient ones, the gritty people who've been willing to hang on or even find new solutions and new ways of doing things in the middle of a really difficult situation are the ones who are really coming out. Exactly. Of it's, it's it's totally true. It's absolutely true. And, um, you know, and, and I, I talk to so many single moms just because I, obviously, you know, I've got a passion for that. And I talk to so many single moms and I really want to develop a single mom group or a single parent group that people can help out. I actually was so fortunate. I had a neighbor who homeschooled her children. And so while I was working for jobs, you know, she was, she was there. And I think without her, I would have had a different future. So mm -hmm. I really feel like we have to get support where it's needed out there. 
Um, and and that includes the kids. You know, we've we've got to do an outreach. And if, if PTSA taught me anything, it's that there are people that are willing to donate their time and resources to help others. Um, you know, these parents, they you know, they they did it for the love of their kids. You know, um, you know, people don't spend. You don't become a PTSA president or PTSA treasurer because you know you, you have an honorary title. It's a lot of work. I mean, it's like a, a part time job and sometimes a full time job. Mm. So you don't do those things because you're you're looking for a title. You've got to love it. You've got to have passion for it. And um, and I really do believe that there are good people out there that want to better you know, other people. Um, and we just need to tap into that. We need to figure out how to make that happen in the in Virginia Beach schools. One thing that you mentioned when you were talking about having people to come alongside and help the kids, I actually was thinking big brother type situation. So mm -hmm. I was glad yeah. that you mentioned that because I feel like right now there's a lot of people who feel very passionately about helping resolve some of the equity issues or some of mm -hmm. the other issues that they see going on and want to know how to help in a practical way and don't really know where to start and may not even have kids yet, you know, maybe in the younger, you know, young professionals or something like that. And yeah, we would love some, them. Yeah, there's some interesting opportunities. It sounds like with mentorship, but also segueing into some of the workforce things uh, you, I know that's something you're really passionate about creating those opportunities. And I think what you've been saying about resilience and all of that ties in really well. Uh, I, I work in recruiting and every single awesome. company I'm looking for their number one characteristic is being a self-starter, you know? Yes. Oh my and, gosh. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I'm sure you have that yeah. on every job description, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. what do you see as the, you know, changes that need to be made or, uh, you know, things you would want to see implemented in terms of preparing our kids more for the workforce. And I would think also, you know, I know we have a bit of, or I've heard people talk about uh, the challenge of brain drain in Virginia Beach, where we produce really bright students that go away to college and then don't come back. So, you know, what do you see being the tie-ins between preparing kids for the workforce through our education system and then creating opportunities for them to want to come back or stay or be involved here. Okay. So let me just start with the workforce opportunities because, you know, as I told you, I did go to college. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I'm sorry, I, you know, did well in high school and I thought that that was my future. Right. And, um, and then, you know, life happens and you make decisions and all of a sudden you're on a different path. And honestly, the journey of going into the military was unexpected, but probably one of the best things I ever did. Um, I never did finish getting my degree. Um, you know, at, at one point it was one of my big regrets. I did actually go to TCC and I've got a bunch of credits there that are probably expired now. But, um, but you know, I, I've really felt like that was one of my goals, but I've gotta be honest, as a mortgage banker, I can't tell you how many people I run into, kids, especially right now, but also adults, adults that, that get their master's degree because their job requires that to get to the next level, you know, that are in hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. And that is going to weigh them down for 30 plus years. It's like having a mortgage before you even get out and get started working. Um, and it's really unfortunate. And this is why I'm so passionate about workforce um, promotion because of the fact, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I was so lucky to jump into this career where you don't necessarily need to have a college degree. I, ha I can't tell you how many college degree uh, educated folks uh, with college degrees, I should say, um, you know, are, are doing my job right now. And we we're doing the same, you know, I'm, I'm probably making more money than they are because guess what? I've had to be a self-starter as a single mom and do all those things. You know, I've had to get out there and work my tail off and um, that's something I'm still willing to do. So as you can see, education, in my personal opinion, just looking at the people in my person, my own field, you know, if you, if you have education without drive, if you have education without, without um, career ability, then you have nothing. My daughter, you know, graduated from NC State and came back to this area because I begged her to. She would have loved to stay at Raleigh. <laughs> Raleigh but, um, is a pretty cool town. But. <laughs> it's, it's an awesome town. But, um, you know, she came back here and uh, and, and basically, you know, she is, she, I, I don't know, honestly, that her degree helped her at all. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, did she have a great time at NC State? She did. Okay, great. So we've just spent, you know, uh, $40,000 a year for her to have a great time. You know, how smart was that? But, uh, and I, I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm not poo-pooing education. I think absolutely, if that is your goal and that's your drive and that's what you want to do and you will want to go into engineering or you want to go into something that it will further your career and you can see um, a good result because of that education, Absolutely. I think education is incredibly important. I wish more people had a better grasp of, of certain topics, <laughs> you know, had more knowledge about stuff. But, um, but the fact is, it's not everything. You've got to have drive. You got to give the Val Sal Award out there for people that have, you know, the drive and the passion and the fortitude to do a good job. Um, you know, and that because those that is what, and I'm sure that you would agree being in recruiting, that is what employers are looking for. They are looking for people that are get the job done and be efficient and not take eight hours to do a two hour job. You know, those are the things that are going to be the um, the skills that people need. And so what I would love to do is, and I've talked to a lot of employers out there, I would love to connect those people. In fact, I'm going to tell you, I, ha I had a teacher tell me that they felt so bad because they had a student who clearly was never going to go to college, but he was amazing, amazing with his hands. He could fix anything. And he was like 14 years old. So he could do anything with his hands. You asked him to fix a, a radio or, or this or that. And he was just doing it. He would just do it. Blah, blah, blah. He's done. Okay. So, so basically she said it was, it was so disappointing because he was clearly not going to go to college, but yet he had to spend all of his time going to class every day, feeling like a failure because he was not a great student. And you could, she said, you could just see his personality kind of diminish every single little bit every day. What mm -hmm. if we instead took those kids who knew that they were not college bound for whatever reason, and we instead instilled in them at a freshman age or at a sophomore age or whatever, whatever we, we, we figure out is the right age. Um, we instill in them an opportunity. Hey, you are good with your hands. Do you want to go work at an auto shop? You know, we'll, we'll give you credits for doing that. You know, I got credits at TCC for my military experience, right? And so something very similar to that, we'll give you credits for doing that, going out there and showing off what you can do. Not only is that going to help them increase their confidence and their drive, and also, mm -hmm. by the way, we can also give them a little bit of money so that if they ever decide to go to college and get a degree, they'll have a little bit of a head start. You know, I was lucky enough, um, even as a single mom, I my daughter went to TCC for her first two years, actually three years. And, you know, so she knocked out a bunch of credits. I paid cash for all of that. So when mm -hmm. she decided to finish off her four-year degree, you know, we didn't have as much student debt, right? And right. so, so quite frankly, I, I mean, there are so many opportunities and I feel like she was more mature when she went, she was able to, you know, get more from the experience as an, an older, um, you know, uh, adolescent or uh, older teenager. Um, and, and I, I think she was actually, uh, 22 when she went to NC State, I think. I don't know. I have to look at that. But, but anyway, in any case, I what you mean. The, the point is that, um, that, you know, if we provide these opportunities, you know, it's not like education is never going to happen, but let's give them things that are going to build confidence, give them a, some skill sets so that they can go out and be a success post high school. And that's really kind of in my, in my head what I'm looking at here. Let's, if they're good at something, you know, we should bring back shop class, give them an opportunity to, to get hands on with things to see, do I like this? Do I really enjoy this? Okay. Well, that might be my skill. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and allow kids to really take some true direction with their life instead of be forced to sit in a classroom for those kids that probably won't ever use those, those subjects again. You know, let's actually give them a head start. Virginia Beach does have quite a few different programs from mm -hmm. they what do. I understand, right? It's between they have the different academies uh -huh. mm -hmm. and the... Um, they have an apprenticeship program right the now. Trade, mm -hmm. And there's a trade mm -hmm. school as well, right? That covers some of those topics yes. or no? Mm -hmm. Well, they're, so they have the ATC, which definitely is is wonderful. It's Advanced Training Center, um, and so they they uh, obviously they can go there. They can get college credits there. They can you know get in more hands on, um, and they do have some apprenticeship opportunities. What I want to do is I want to expand that a little bit more and allow people that that would not necessarily be going the college route to have to take you know. Um, 
advanced math or to, you know whatever maybe change some of the curriculum for students that are, are not on the college bound path that are more on the workforce path and see what we can do to give them opportunities with different employers to get out there and spend two hours a day you know hands on somewhere trying trying a trade maybe maybe trying um, an opportunity you know um, being a, a apprentice for an electrician or you know or something like that where they can actually see if they enjoy it um, and, and give them an opportunity to, to see what feels good to them and again I think that's only going to help them in and instill in confidence in them because with them sitting in a classroom failing classes is not a confidence builder. Mm -hmm. that, that's not a confidence builder. And so I feel like if we can create opportunities where they can build confidence, feel like they're actually doing something um, that is going to impact their future, I think is only going to be a good thing for them. And also, and quite honestly, some of those students are the ones creating disruptions because they're bored, because they hate being in school, because, you know, they, they need to have um, outlets where they can figure out what they can do with their energy. We're drawing to the end of our time, and I, I would love to have you share what's one thing you want everyone to keep in mind about you as they're going to vote uh, in the next few weeks. Well, what I would say is that I have got a lot of supporters from both sides of the aisle. I would ask that you actually choose the best people for the job and not worry about partisan lines. I would ask that you look for people that really want to support your teachers and students. And again, not listen to what everybody else has to say. Make a decision for yourself and not just a decision based on party lines, um, because this is a nonpartisan position. I've got people who support me from both sides of the aisle, and I want to keep it that way. I want to I want let, to let people know that I am a hard worker. I want to support teachers and students um, and, and get the job done and stop all the bickering. Sounds great. Quick note, I know everyone is tired of hearing about it, but today is the <laughs> very last day to register to vote in Virginia. So that's right. If Good job. Not voted, or if you haven't registered to vote yet, get it done today. It's linked in my Instagram profile. You can go to vote.virginia.gov. There's lots of easy ways. Uh, it takes one minute. Just that's do right. it. And, Great job. Uh, then you can. Um, early vote till October 31st and then general election is November 3rd. Jennifer's on the ballot along with lots of other great people. Um, don't forget to follow Smart Citizen on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Smart Citizen USA. And uh, we look forward to having a lot more conversations coming Yay. up with different people. But Jennifer, I really appreciate your time today and Absolutely. Uh, really enjoyed the conversation. So best of luck and hopefully we'll talk again soon. All right. Great. Thank you.